from cassettepunk.com. Um, a couple of years ago, I entered the Moog Circuit Bending Challenge. What I did was I took this kid's guitar and modified it to generate uh, three outputs for a synthesizer instead of one. The three outputs drove these three speakers, but they also drove this CD-ROM controller motor. And my idea was that I was going to hopefully make the big brother of this, which is what I intended to do all along. Um, in the process of finishing this, I put out the word that I was looking for the big brother to this kid's toy, which is obviously a keytar. And a friend of mine, Brent, came through with this 1984 Korg original RK100 keytar. Um, the catch was that it wasn't working. Uh, this usually would have output a MIDI signal on the back, and it's a pretty simple MIDI controller. Uh, there's no um, pressure sensitivity on these keys, they're just on or off. So it's basically a bunch of switches, a bunch of diodes, and then a small uh, CPU that would convert those signals into the MIDI signals, which is a very simple protocol itself. When I worked with the keytar, I discovered that the these are the two circuit boards here. This essentially deals with power on this side, and this one here is the CPU and some support circuitry. Essentially, it was dead, and I didn't spend a whole lot of time debugging why it was dead, but um, I did some research online and discovered that uh, you know these old CPUs of this sort of age just frequently weren't working. And I, I'm not so interested myself in reverse engineering. So what I did instead was I took a, uh, um, an 18 mega chip, an 18 mega 32, and then built a replacement for these two boards on a single small perf board. And what this illustrates to me is that um, you used to have to build these with a lot of circuitry. Uh, there's a lot of uh, you know demoxes and a lot of power control circuitry and all this kind of stuff. Um, and with the increased power of small CPUs like the 18 mega line. Um, all of that's disappeared simply into the main chip, which is the same size as this 40-pin uh, CPU here, but essentially just has a lot of flexibility and a lot of power that makes this kind of project collapse into the CPU and then makes the rest basically just a simple breakout board. So this Korg is now the Franken Korg in that it still looks the same, uh, it still has the same controls, still has the same interface, it's still a MIDI interface, but aside from just the bare switches that uh, are unchanged on this from what they originally were, the entire um, brain of it has been swapped with a new brain. So I've just opened the keyboard and taken off the circuit board. This is the new circuit board I've built. You can see it's just protoboard on the back. Um, this reflects my approach to building things, which frankly is not all that uh, systematic. I like to start with things simple and then uh, build them up bit by bit from there. So what I was able to do is put the 18 mega chip on the board, add the in-circuit programming header, and then just test that, that was working, um, and then sort of think from there where to start building out. And as you can see, I just stuck the chip right in the middle of the board, then worried about the details later. All of these various cables here come in from various corners of the keyboard. There's one, uh, I think two ribbon cables from the neck here, one for the digital controls, and then one for the analog controls, the three potentiometers. And then there's another one from the keyboard proper, which is down here. There's one from the two banks of LEDs, or one each from the two banks of LEDs. There's uh, 16 LEDs in total. And then another one here from the direct program switches. And so those all just come onto the board here, where I've mounted headers to accept them. Um, and this was one way that I could make this project without um, having to modify the internals. And so ideally, if someone was to fix the original circuit boards that came with this, or show interest in them, um, they'd be able to reinstall them in this without uh, any modifications being undone. Um, what we've got is the AT Mega 32 controller. We've got uh, three HC one or LS138 um, 3 to 8 demoxers. The reason I built those in is because I don't quite have enough pins on this 40 pin dip package to just jam everything straight into an I/O port. I had to use some 3 to 8 muxes to allow me to uh, perform keypad style scanning on all the various key controls here. I was only a few pins short actually, so I was uh, very close to being able to do this. But I figured once I built in one of these, I might as well build in a few. So. I've got uh, one for each of the LED banks, and then one uh, for the various um, keypad grid-oriented um, pinouts for these. The next step for this project, if I do pursue the original goal of making the big brother of this kid's toy, is to get a washing machine and to mount a large uh, trio of speakers inside the drum, and then have the signals that, that power the motor come from a synthesizer here, which will generate, uh, ideally, square, sine, triangle waves, some simple waveforms. Those will then energize, in turn, the three different coils, using the same software I wrote for this guy. 
and those will not just energize the coils in the, in the motor, but also the three speakers. So I'm hoping that when I mount three big speakers on a drum of a washing machine, um, as the drum spins, it'll hopefully spin quickly and uh, make some noise by itself, but then the speakers will um, generate the waveforms audibly that are used to power the speaker. My hope is that the combination of the motion and the speakers will generate uh, a pretty crazy set of phasing effects. You'll obviously have to um, play the keyboard in a way that um, works for the motor. Let's say starting at a low frequency and then coming up to spin it up to speed. And once you get up to speed, I might have some flexibility in jumping between frequencies that are close without losing the motor sync entirely and having it crawl to a stop. If the motor's stopped, obviously, we'll still get the speakers generating output, but we won't have the, uh, the motor spinning. So my challenge is, this is my workspace. Um, I'm not sure whether I'm going to have enough space to get a small washing machine for this one purpose, but um, I'm hoping to use an approach that's going to allow me to do minimal customization on the washing machine, get a small um, three-phase uh, washing machine, use the existing driver circuitry built into it, and then hopefully if I can get one that's semi-broken, I can come by it easily, do my modifications, and then demonstrate that it works, and then discard the washing machine and have all of the actual logic and, and brains live in something I can keep that's not quite so big. So a quick demonstration of this working, um, I've got installed here a tool called QSynth, which is a software synthesizer for Linux. Um, I have it plugged in via a MIDI to USB adapter, the standard thing, and with QSynth um, we're modeling sort of traditional keyboards. So this one's a piano, you can see that we're doing obviously multiple presses at once for a chord. Um, it gets fun with guitar because we've got these neck controls and they have a bend. And there's also um, a multi-purpose knob here that's uh, only, I think, got one function with QSynth, which is a bit of a tremolo. There. And there's the octave switch as well. The low notes on these synthesizers are pretty cool. Almost like a gong. There's a volume control. And there's also, uh, up here there's a program up-down button as well, which allows me to select between the various different uh, programs that are built into QSynth. I've got these direct access buttons to jump right to a, a program, or else I can just scroll between them with the up and down buttons. So there's a piano, another piano, it's like a grand piano. Too much bass here for my poor laptop speaker, but that's uh, I think an electric keyboard. Definitely electronic keyboard, electric keyboard. I think we've got a almost a harpsichord. This one gets pretty cool at the low end. And the last one, I forget. So Bristol is the reason I wanted to tinker with this guitar at all. My last project, my last big project was um, to convert a hundred year old um, uh, pump organ, a great big old wooden piano basically, uh, but pneumatically operated, into an uh, electronic keyboard. And I did tinker with that using this Bristol synthesizer, and it was really fun. So we'll just start up here synthesizing an ARP Axe synthesizer. You can see that the interface here, um, as much as possible, mimics the interface of the synthesizer as well. To just pick one other example, which is the one I'll show doing some audio, um, there's one called Sydney, which is basically a software emulation of both the software and hardware features of the SID chip. So this synthesizer never existed, but of course the SID chips uh, made appearances in many different systems, most notably the Commodore 64. So you can play with this obviously with the mouse, so I would recommend if you're interested that you tinker with it, it's kind of fun. A little bit clunky on the interface. But it's way more fun through the MIDI. It's the arpeggiator, it's got a voice, a bass voice.
And obviously all these controls work, so there's tons you can play with here. Thanks for watching. You can see more of my projects at cassettepunk.com.